Last week we began the uh, chapter 21 of the Gospel of John, which was the last story that John wanted to share with regard to the risen Lord. John decided that he was not quite done and needed to give this last story to help us to understand just how the risen Lord relates to his disciples. And I decided to separate this out into four different messages, each one of them tied to the topic of revival or renewal, being restored, being put back the way we were, because that's what happened to Peter in this story. Peter had been the disciple of Jesus, that he was called the rock, he was the leader of the group, and yet on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, Peter disowned him three times. And we're going to see that even though Peter saw the risen Lord on Easter Sunday, and a week later he saw him again, he was still not restored to where he needed to be. And so in the beginning of the chapter, Peter went fishing, because that's what he knew. He was going back to the old life. And the first word in the process of revival that I found last week was initiation. It is Jesus Christ who initiates our relationship with him. If you recall, the people in the boat, Peter and his friends, they were catching fish. Well, no, they were trying to catch fish. They fished like I fished. They caught nothing all night long. And yet, the stranger on the seashore initiated the relationship. He told them to cast on the other side, and they could find some food. And they did. The second word is recognition. And we find this recognition in the passage here. In verse 7, after they caught the 153 fish and the net didn't break and all of that was going on, the apostle John, the disciple, said to him, it is the Lord. Now, we don't see the Lord in the same way that the disciples saw the Lord. And the reason isn't because Jesus is invisible. It's because Jesus is in heaven. When he ascended into heaven, he brought his Holy Spirit down to us. And so it is through the Holy Spirit that we experience Jesus Christ. And so as we live our Christian lives, we begin to recognize the fingerprints of God in our lives. And the question is, how do we do that? Well, that's what I'd like this whole message to be about. How do we recognize when God is really working? But before we get there, I want to tell the rest of the story. So, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, what did he do? Well, he, he put on his outer garment and he jumped into the sea. And normally, when you're going to go swimming, what do you do? You take off your coat, right? And Peter, he put his on, and it makes me wonder what he was doing. Um, my thought is that he may have been thinking about another time when he got out of a boat. And in that time, he actually walked on water. It's possible. I don't know. For whatever reason, he put his coat on, and then he jumped into the water. He was eager for fellowship. He wanted to be with the Lord. And sometimes when we are eager for the Lord, we will do things that are outside of our normal way of doing things just because we want to be with the Lord. And we may find the Lord working in different places. He may be showing up at a men's conference. And so we decide to go to a men's conference. We never go to men's conferences, but we want to be with the Lord, so we go. Or maybe a prayer meeting, or a hymn sing. 
Whatever it is that God is calling you to do, or wherever you happen to see him working, you might want to go. And that's what happened to Peter. He decided he wanted to see the Lord, and so he jumped out of the boat, and he went. Now, the, not to say that the other disciples didn't want to see the Lord either. They just didn't want to get wet, okay? The other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from the land, but about 200 cubits, dragging the net with them. Now, they were overflowing with the blessing of the Lord. And if they, everybody had jumped into the boat, into the water, I think the fish would have gotten away, wouldn't they? But they didn't. So some people have to work. And it reminds me of Mary and Martha as, as they are taking care of Jesus. Mary's sitting there enjoying Jesus, and Martha's working in the kitchen. And so I think the same, similar dynamics are going on here. Uh, we got Peter swimming toward Jesus, and the other's rowing the boats. One's going to get there a little faster than the other, but they've got the same destination. And the boat, by the way, has the blessing. And it's the blessing that we are looking for here. We're looking for the blessing of revival. We're looking for the blessing of restoration and the overflowing that can happen in our hearts as we commune with our Lord and obey him in doing those things that he's calling us to do. So I'm not going to fault the disciples for not swimming. They did the right thing. They brought the boat in. And as soon as they came to the land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish were laid on it, and bread. So Jesus already had fish for them, and they were already cleaned and already cooked and ready to eat. Where did that fish come from? Did he go out fishing? I don't know. But I do know this. Jesus is Lord of the harvest. Jesus is able to. To produce anything out of nothing. And he works on his own. He does provide for us. He doesn't need us to do his work. And I know that might be contrary to what we in our exalted view of ourselves might think. That if I don't do it, it's not going to get done. And yet, this is a clear illustration that God does provide. God does work. <laughs> However, on the other hand, Jesus does want us to participate. He said to them, bring some of the fish which you have caught. Now Simon Peter went up and he dragged the net to the land and it was full of large fish, 153 and although there were so many, the net was not broken. You see, Jesus doesn't need us, but he wants us to participate. He invites us to do the good work that he called us to do. The scriptures call us, the body of Christ, his hands and his feet. We are the ones who are doing his work. We are his ambassadors. We are the ones who tell people about Jesus. Think of it this way. Maybe we are more like branches than we are like the vine. And branches do, in fact, bear fruit. When we bear fruit, we don't bear it for ourselves, do we? We don't need our own fruit. We bear it for other people. And it is in the bearing of fruit that we find blessing and are able to bless others but we can never do it on our own. It only happens as we abide in the vine. And of course, you know how a vine works. If you cut all the branches off, the root is still there, and it'll grow new branches. The root doesn't need the branches in the same way that the branches need the root. And so we are dependent on Christ. But in that dependency, we are like Christ. In fact, the way Martin Luther said it, we are little Christs. We are the ones who go around as ambassadors, telling people about him and living as if he were here. And that's what Jesus is calling us to do, giving us an opportunity to participate in. And as we do this, 
we become revived, we become restored. It's part of that process. Now the invitation is for you and it's for me, just as it was for the disciples. Jesus said to them, come and eat breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Then Jesus came and he took the bread and he gave it to them and, and likewise the fish. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. This is where I see a relationship with Jesus Christ. And we can have that relationship on a regular basis through prayer and through the reading of scripture. As we abide in him, we begin to bear fruit. We can be restored. But how do we understand that God is working? Since we don't see Jesus on the shore calling to us, what do we experience? And how do we know that it's really him? Well, I'd like to talk about a few things. First of all, we can discern God's work by looking at the work itself. Is the work that is being done in your life consistent with God's character? That's the first thing I would look at. Numbers 23, 19 says, God is not a man that he should lie. He is not a son of man that he should repent. Has he said and will he not do? Or has he spoken and will he not make it good? So if God's not a liar, then he's not going to do anything that's inconsistent, that doesn't have integrity with himself. And so who is God? What is his character? Well, we know that he's holy. What else do we know about him? He's loving. Okay, he's loving. Others? Forgiving? Always yes, he's ever present. And he's full of grace. And he's full of mercy. He doesn't want to treat us according to our sins. He wants to treat us according to his own character. We need to put ourselves in a place that we can receive that. And so, if there are things happening in your life, that you think that maybe God is working, you can judge it and decide, well, is that part of his character? And, and I'm here to tell you, he'll never contradict his word. So if you, for instance, came to me, gentlemen, and said, oh, I feel that God is leave, calling me to leave my wife and marry another woman, I would say, no, he's not. And I can say that with authority, because the word of God says that God hates divorce. Now, I know that divorce happens because of our hard hearts, and there are places for that because sin enters the world. But the principle is God is <clears throat> full of compassion and generosity, patience, and forgiveness. And he wants us to be that way toward our spouses. 